I will be your mistress of ceremony for today's program. I want to begin the program by the ringing of a bell. We know that a bell can signal alarm, a bell can signal a clarion call for whatever that task, that work that must be done. A bell also can symbol unity in service. So I would like to ring the bell. We will now have the welcome by Pastor Ed Richardson. Everybody say amen. amen. We are in a church, amen. I know y'all are in church this morning. And, uh, but this is going to be a service unto God. Yeah. Amen. 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 I want to welcome you all here as pastor of Love Christian Center and as a member of the Douglas Spaulding branch of the NAACP. We welcome you to our installation service, installation of officers, and we hope that you will join our branch if you're not a member already. Amen. And I would be remiss and not uh, channeling our president if I didn't put on my treasurer appointee hat and let you know that all of y'all that are going to be paying taxes on next year, that this might be one of the last opportunities that you have to make a charitable tax deductible donation before the end of the year. I think I need to change the batteries. In it. Okay, here we go. So, if you would like to make a charitable tax deductible donation prior to the end of the year, we'll be glad to take that from you on today as well. Amen, Madam Amen. President. Amen. On behalf of my wife, the co-pastor of Love Christian Center, we welcome you and we thank you all for coming. Now we'll have our invocation by Pastor Franklin, Pastor Ford. Amen. Let us bow for a word of prayer. Father God, we come once again before your holy presence. First of all, I say thank you, Lord, for another day. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, this hour, dear God, that we're able to assemble together in your name. And Lord, anything that we do, Heavenly Father, we want it to be done righteous and in good order. So, Lord, we invite you, Heavenly Father, to be in the midst, dear God. Lord, fill up this room with your presence, Heavenly Father, from the roof to the floor, dear God, and everywhere in between. So that every decision that we make, every oath that we take, Heavenly Father, is in your presence, dear God. For we know that when we're in your presence, Heavenly Father, there is liberty, dear God. That we might go forth in your works and in your permission, Heavenly Father. Know that we might be spokespersons, Heavenly Father, from on high. So we thank you right now for being in the midst of us, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Lord, for being in and each and every one of us that gather here today. Lord, that as we move forward in this service, Heavenly Father, Lord, we know that we're moving forward in your will, dear God. And Lord, right now, we rebuke the enemy in every shape, form, and fashion that he is, Heavenly Father. Lord, he, though he might have hitched a ride with someone here this afternoon, dear God, we rebuke him right now. For he has no place, no authority, Heavenly Father, amongst us, Heavenly Father. We rebuke him right now. Every scheme, every trick, dear God, that all of us might walk in your light and in your authority, Heavenly Father. So Lord, have your way in this place, dear God. Touch right now, dear God. Lord, empower right now, Heavenly Father. Uh, in your word, dear Lord, as we go forth to do your works in your will, that we might help someone. For you said, Lord, that when we see someone hungry, our job is to feed them. When someone's thirsty, Lord, to give them drink. When someone's sick, Lord, we are to visit them. When they're naked, to call them, Heavenly Father. When they're in prison, Lord, to visit them, Heavenly Father. That way, they will know that you still sit high. You have lived over the cries of your children. So we thank you for this time, this opportunity, this hour. Have your way right now in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and our Redeemer, we do pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Almighty and High God. God is worthy to be praised. Yes, Amen. God is worthy to be praised. I want to share with you all, I want to set a context for this installation service as your mistress of ceremony. I am the youngest of nine children. 
born and raised in South Georgia, down way real hot, and the mosquitoes are real big. And my parents, um, they paved the way. They were way pavers for us nine children. My dad worked uh, for the city of Albany, Georgia. He was um, a mechanic, but back then, I believe, he just serviced the trucks, changed the oil. However, my father had a passion for working the land. He was a farmer. Now, being the youngest of nine children, I was very fortunate to be able to escape some of the toil and labor that my older siblings had to do in the fields. However, on the occasion that I had the opportunity, was told, selected to go to the field, I went. I thought it was going to be fun out there. My daddy raised, we say raised, he planted watermelons, he raised watermelons. And I don't know if any of you have ever been in a watermelon field. Have any of you ever been in a watermelon field? Okay. Those rows of watermelon plants are long. And as a child, I can remember staring down the road that was assigned to me, and I could never see the end of that road. I was like, how am I going to do this work? Turning the vines, bending over and stooping and turning those vines, using that hoe to clear the weeds so that the fruit of that plant would have an opportunity to thrive and come forth. Well, on one occasion, I was in that field. There were other people working in toiling, some siblings, some hired help. And I was beginning to feel the heat of that hot day bearing down on me around eight or nine years old. And I was doing the work that my father instructed me to do, carefully using the tools that he had given to do the work, which was a hoe. Now, as I was hoeing and getting those weeds out in between those fragile watermelon plants, I kept thinking about, I ain't gonna never get to the end of that road. And I can remember my dad saying to me, Annie, because that's my given name, Annie, that's a long road. And you got a long road to hope. A long road to hope. The work the mission, the vision of the NAACP is a long road to hope. Laborers are needed. The tools are needed to do this work. Think of that long road. Our predecessors have already started working on that road. That's why we are reaping the benefit of their labor and their toil. So remember today, as we go through this beautiful installation service for the newly elected officers of the Midwest Metro branch of the NAACP, that we must support, we must do our share, we must serve, we must do the labor required for the long run that we all must have. We're going to move on in the program. And at this time, we're going to have um, the singing collectively of uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing. And if you will turn your program over, you will find the words to the song.
today. And I also want to share with you all uh, a few thoughts that were revealed to me in my preparation for this honor and service that I am performing today. You know, God has made it possible for our people to make many advances. Yet we know the struggle is still the struggle. Now, I got a few nods. I saw a few nods when I said the struggle is still the struggle. But I want to know, do we recognize that the struggle is still the struggle? In 2018, the plight of our people seeking justice is still not answered. It's still not resolved. However, we know that God is able God is able to turn a thing around, but there has to be that person who is willing to heed God's call to serve. And I want to know, are there any people here in this place today that are willing to heed the call to serve? Are there, are there some that are willing? Well, you're going to have your opportunity, uh, President Lake. Minister Bates is going to see to that before the end of this program that you will be able to respond to that call to serve. The other thing that I would like to share, another thought with you all, is that as we do this work that is required, and it is required for our people to advance and to realize their fullness in God's promises, that we must do so in unity, and we must do it in love. I am reminded um, that God's word says in 1 Peter 2.11 that all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, and love one another, be compassionate, and humble. Because it's required that we recognize that we are human and God is superhuman. God is supernatural. And it is God's power in us that will allow us to do the work to ensure that justice rings like a clear sound of the bell. Amen. All right, we're going to move on, and at this time, um, I would like to welcome to the podium Madam President, Minister Joy Bates, who will introduce the speaker for this afternoon. Jones is. 
He's a humble man. Even when we were conversing, uh, he said, hey sis, you ain't got to say much about me. And so with that, I'm not going to read the Bible. I'm going to allow you to do that for yourself. But I do want to tell you some things that I know about Reverend Jones. When asked, how you doing, Kayla Mark? His response is always, I'm grateful. When I ask him, would you do this installation service for me, the officers and the chairs? He said, Joy, nothing would keep me from being here. And then he said, and you know what? I'm going to join the NAACP and work alongside you. Amen. Which also tells me that K. Lamar is supportive of the people who he loves and of the community that he loves. If only he lived in Douglas or Paul that we have him right in here. Uh, K. Lamar is a scholar and one of the brilliant minds in our community. He has a keen understanding of the damage caused by the transatlantic slave trade. And not just for people who look like us, but the damage that it caused to our counterparts as well. He has a clear voice when speaking to God's people. And to be honest with you, I could go on and on and on and on about my brother and my friend. But instead, I'm going to take my seat and let you see for yourselves. Please join me in welcoming Reverend K. Lamont Jones. God be the glory. The great things he has done. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and yes. be glad in it. Aren't you glad to be here today? Yes. Amen. Amen. I know that it's uh, late in the afternoon, it's rainy, you're tired of sleep, but it's a great thing to be here today. You're all forced to say, I'm glad to be in the service. Yes. Just one more time. Yes. Why? Because you didn't have to let, let me live, did you? That's right. You didn't have to let me live, so I'm glad to be in the service just one more time. Uh, to Madam. President Joy Bates, Minister Joy Bates, I am grateful indeed for this opportunity and for this experience. To the leadership and membership of this great house, the Love Christian Center, I want to salute and celebrate Pastors Ed and the son Richardson. Can we help celebrate them? For their <laughs> hospitality. We don't know me from Adam, you allow me to share this sacred space, so I thank you all for that. To also the leadership and membership of the local chapter of the West um, Metro NAACP, as well as local other chapters and state representatives, we give God the glory and praise for this wonderful occasion. I'm indeed grateful to be here. I asked Minister Joy uh, how much time did I have? You know, about the preachers, we can give us a microphone. <laughs> we may take one. And she said, Reverend, I want to be done in under an hour. And I said, Okay, I know my part can. Uh, but I seriously just want to share a few words with you to encourage you along the way. And this is something that is un called, un uh, I guess, a rare occasion to have this experience of installation service for uh, the officers here. Uh, and that speaks to really that you want the Lord's hand to be upon your work. Amen. The Lord's blessing is going to be upon this great work. And so with that being said, let me get on to the task at hand. I want to ask you if you have your Bibles uh, to turn to... Second Corinthians, Second uh, Thessalonians, Second Timothy, brother, chapter four, uh, verse seven. Second Timothy, chapter four, verse seven. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Translation of the Bible. Second Timothy, chapter four, verse seven. Yes, I'm welcome to stand. If you want to stand with us in the first day, God's word you may do so. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, reads as follows. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my race. I have kept the faith. That's enough you may be <laughs> Just by way of encouragement, I want to 
want to leave with a message. Stay committed. Stay committed. My wife and I live in what's called a house divided. It is an expression in college football terms that describes two opposing fans who happen to be married living in the same house. My wife subscribes to and supports the Ohio State University Buckeyes <laughs> because she earned a graduate degree work from there. I, on the other hand, I support and cheer for the University of Michigan Wolverines, whom I have supported since I was a child coming to understand what college football is all about. And although the Wolverines have uh, the majority rec winning record against Ohio State since this contest in 1897, mm -hmm. uh, my team has not beaten the Buckeyes since 2011. Well, now to help you put that in perspective, my Buckeyes, my, my Wolverines have not beaten the Buckeyes since me and Tammy got married. Well, <laughs> the Marines have not beaten the Buckeyes in almost seven years since we've been married. And the beautiful thing about the rivalry is that it brings out the best in each team. Mm -hmm. The other day, on November 24th, this past November, the Buckeyes and the Marines had a contest and we got mocked. The score was 62 to 39. I was upset because my team didn't even show up to play. They were not competitive at all. However, what struck me as most interesting is that I knew in the very first quarter that my team was going to lose and lose badly. How did I know that? Because my team was too predictable. And I can tell you right now, I can close my eyes lean my head back against our couch, and I can tell you every single play that the Wolverines were going to run. On first down, they was going to run left. On second down, they was going to run to the right. On third down, they would pass, and on fourth down, they would be forced most likely to punt. They were that predictable. Everybody in the stadium knew what the Wolverines were going to do. The Buckeyes knew. The fans in the stadium knew. The folks walking on watching on television knew what the Wolverines were going to do. Sports commentators tried to analyze Michigan's offense and their style of play. And they said that Michigan needs to open up the playbook a little bit more because they need to keep Ohio State off balance. But as if to correct himself, he added this. But Michigan is so committed to the run. They are so predictable that everybody knows what to expect from them. Now, I don't like my team being predictable and being so committed that you can figure out the next play because it means in the end they're not going to win. However, I do want leaders who are in positions within the NAACP and other organizations who fight against injustice, who fight against racial inequality, I do want them so committed because at the end of the day, my people will win. Is this idea of being staying and being committed that is on the Apostle Paul's mind as he writes this second letter to his young protege and student Timothy? Mm -hmm. Paul is so concerned about him being committed to the ministry that he's been called into that he writes to him in an installation type of service way. Mm -hmm. In chapter 4, we have a kind of an installation. Here is young Timothy getting ready to go into the pastoral ministry. And Paul writes to him about fulfilling his ministry. Mm -hmm. And when he writes to him, the first five verses, he says something like this. He gives him a charge. He said, I charge you to preach the word. Mm -hmm. He says, preach the word when they do want to hear the truth. That's right. wow. And when they don't, don't want to hear the truth. Uh -huh. He goes down the line and says, I want you to be sober-minded. Mm -hmm. That is, so you can think clearly and prayerfully. He says to endure suffering because it comes along with the journey. And then he says, I want you to do the work of an evangelist. I want you to be on a seek and rescue mission. And then he says this to summarize everything that he has just said. He says, Timothy, I want you to fulfill your ministry. 
Now I like this because that's the sticking point that is on Paul's mind, <coughs> fulfilling one's ministry. Because in the real sense, beloved, we cannot fulfill our ministry or fulfill anything in life if we are not first committed. Right. And that's the sticking point that Paul wants to drive home to his young, his young protege. That, Timothy, I want you to stay committed. Not just be committed, but stay committed. And so after telling Timothy that pretty soon his life is going to come to an end, he begins to lay out his own life's work in ministry as an example of what it means to stay committed. And not only is he talking to Timothy, he's also talking to us who are being installed into this major office today. Now I hear you saying, wait a minute, preacher, I'm, 